Members, the sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. We start with listed questions, and I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. Uh, over hand, question one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my number one priority is to help create the conditions for Northern Ireland to become a globally competitive economy. A key part of this is to create more and better jobs in Northern Ireland. My department is developing a new economic strategy which sets out our ambition to grow the size of the economy and create jobs across our country. Wider policy responsibility for the retail sector is shared by a number of executive departments. In terms of job promotion, support from my department is primarily aimed at assisting companies to trade outside of Northern Ireland. This brings money into the economy, which has a multiplier effect and indirectly supports domestic-facing sectors such as retail. My department and Invest Northern Ireland have worked closely with the full range of businesses across Northern Ireland, including those in the retail sector, and a wide range of initiatives are available that offer support and guidance to local retailers. For example, Invest NI's business support team and NI Business Info, the website, provides a valuable source of business information and signposting to specialist advice for retailers. Invest NI has supported local councils to develop programs that are open and accessible to retail businesses, and they can also avail of Invest NI's wide range of workshops and seminars. I'm particularly encouraged that some of our town centres are benefiting from recent exchange rate changes, which have seen an increase in cross-border shopping, bringing more money into the Northern Ireland economy. Mr. McAleer, for a supplementary. Well, good. Uh, thank the Minister for his answer. answer. Uh, can the Minister um, advise us on what additional specific measures he intends to take to create jobs in the retail sector, particularly in the aftermath of the closure of Austin's and Derry, BHS, a number of other uh, high profile businesses? Mr. Speaker, as, as I pointed out to, to the member in my, my initial response, Policy has traditionally been, I think, for very good reason, not to support financially um, uh, re businesses in the retail sector um, because of uh, they, they tend to be, uh, and by and large, locally facing, not generally export focused. Uh, and there is the, the concern um, around issues of displacement, as it is called. So, an investment in a retail business, in say, for example. Uh, OMA could displace jobs, could displace trade away from a business in, in Strabane. Uh, and clearly that would have a, you know, it might have a benefit in one side to one business, it would have a knock-on negative effect elsewhere. So that, that's, that's, those are some of the reasons why we haven't, uh, and we don't, and we will continue not to support retail business in the way that we do other sectors, say, such as manufacturing. Um, I pointed out some of the, the range of types of support and signposting that Invest and I can offer to retail businesses that are short of actual financial support or support to create jobs or, 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 or other areas of, of, of their business. Um, I suppose an exception is perhaps around online retail um, or, or, or wholesale distribution around e retail. And they, they may create, and it would only be where, Mr. Speaker, they would have export opportunities. Um, and if they were genuinely additional in terms of job creation and the sales that they were doing, they could be considered for support from Invest Northern Ireland, on, and that would be on a on a case by case basis. Those examples, don't, those types types of examples of that don't come up very often, um, but if they do, they will be assessed on their merits uh, and could attract, no matter where they are located in Northern Ireland, if they have uh, an online retail outlet where they're selling outside of the region, if they are genuinely additional and perhaps working in wholesale inside of, of retail, and they fit all the various criteria that any um, application would have to go through, they could be considered for, for support of a financial nature. Call Mr. Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that it is uh, important to sustain existing retail jobs uh, in current difficult trading circumstances? And is the Minister and the Executive committed uh, to supporting small businesses in relation to rates review and finding ways to ease the bureaucratic burden on small businesses? I, I know that I'm tempted to ask them, the, the member for his view as a, as a retailer of some, uh, some experience. Um, I, I, I used to work in retail myself, but not, with the, not to the degree of experience that the, the member has. Um, and, and I, I think the executive, Mr. Speaker, has a, a proud record of supporting um, small businesses, which would include uh, many retail businesses. And um, I'm personally very proud of the record um, that my party has in terms of the Department of Finance and the introduction of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, uh, which grew in size over the years from a, uh, a modest and small scheme to the scheme where it's now roughly around £20 million worth of support is being offered 
on an annual basis through rates relief to thousands and thousands of businesses all across Northern Ireland. And I know from, from experience that, Mr. Speaker, that, that many businesses credit the small business rates relief scheme as helping them to keep people in employment, helping them in some cases to help their, their, keep their businesses alive. Um, and nobody wants to prop up or artificially support any business in any sector, but you know, I think we, given the, the challenges that uh, retail has faced, um, with um, particularly coming from uh, the influx or the, the rise and increase in, in online sales over the last number of years, um, that there is a need to, to provide some support. Uh, we've done that through the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. We've done that through, for example, the, the Empty Premises Relief, which I think the current minister has rebranded, but that has allowed over 500 new businesses to open up in what were previously vacant uh, shops um, across Northern Ireland. So we have a proud record of it, and I know that the minister um, is proposing some changes to the rate system. I think there is a need for an examination and reform of elements of, of the rate system, but I think as the, the current minister is, is finding that when you change one element, it has a knock-on effect elsewhere, and I think he needs to carefully consider that, and I'm sure he will intend to do that. Uh, and obviously, the executive will take a, a final position in respect of his proposals whenever the consultation is over. Call Mr. Gordon Dunn. I too thank the minister for his answers. Can the minister give his assessment of how important he sees the retail sector to the Northern Ireland economy, and how our town centres are facing up to the ever-changing challenges? Mr. Speaker, yeah, there, there, I mean, there are. Uh, I accept and acknowledge. I think we all recognise the range of, of challenges that the retail sector has been facing and continues to face. And um, you know, we do see, as I mentioned to, to Mr. Chambers, uh, a huge increase in the volume of trade being done online. And um, used to be just in a few small sectors, but it's now seeming mean, right across, even in, including in, in groceries and convenience in some areas. Um, so there is a huge, huge challenge there. But it, it does still remain an important part of our economy, and I, we may not be able to support it for the reasons that I've outlined in the traditional sense of what we do with manufacturing or production or services. But it, it, is a, it is a huge part of our economy, and I want to see a growing economy which benefits all sectors, including retail. It remains our, our largest employer. Around one in six of all jobs in Northern Ireland are in retail. Um, in terms of the, the contribution that it makes to the economy through gross value added, it, it has been down in the most recent figures in 2015 by around £240 million, but it, it still stands at around £4.8 billion pounds of a contribution uh, and value to our economy, which is around a quarter of the total economy. About 10 per cent of all Northern Ireland businesses um, are retail businesses, and about 37 per cent of the total turnover is retail. So it is a, a big part of our economy, and those figures are comparable to the UK average. I'm very pleased that there has been a, a in terms of bearing up, I'm very pleased that there has been a boost uh, to many retailers across Northern, particularly in border regions, uh, as a result of the fall in value of, of sterling. Uh, and Intertrade Ireland do some work in, in, in analysing the, the um, registrations of cars and car parks are in, in shopping centres and, and supermarkets along the border region, and they are recording a, uh, in quarter three of 2016, 56.8% of cars in border region shopping centres had Re Republic of Ireland registrations. And that has grown from 33% in quarter one to 43% in quarter two, and now up, as I say, to nearly 57% in quarter three. So there is a boost as a result of the uh, fall in the value of sterling, which is a much benefit to local retailers. Call Mr. Cockle Boyle. Over at all, let hold question number two, please. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions two and six together. Since 2008, my department has channelled almost £64 million pounds to encourage private sector upgrades to our telecoms networks, primarily in rural areas. Currently, 83% of households in Northern Ireland can access the internet, compared to 86% across the UK. In Northern Ireland, 94% of premises can now access broadband services of 2 megabits per second or better. Across the UK, the, uh, the figure is 98%. Broadband download speeds in Northern Ireland are continuing to increase. The average download speed now stands at 28.3 megabits per second, just below the UK average of 29 megabits per second. Where there is no doubt that this investment has brought significant improvements for many rural dwellers, I recognise that more needs to be done. My department's Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project has already improved broadband access for over 46,000 premises. Within the new in Armagh constituency, almost 7,000 premises have seen improvements, 1,774, or 25% of which, have taken up new services. The contract which was awarded to BT has a mechanism which requires BT to return funding for reinvestment when take-up of service exceeds a certain threshold. This will allow more premises to see improvements. 
My department is also currently managing the Superfast Rollout Programme, which by 31 December 2017 will provide access to Superfast Broadband with speeds of at least 24 megabits per second to a further 38,000 premises across Northern Ireland, again primarily in rural areas. It is important to recognise that where fixed-line broadband is not uh, viable, there are other technology alternatives available. Details of these can be found on my department's website, and we also intend to publish further information in respect of that. For those premises that continue to have access to services of less than 2 megabits per second, my department offers assistance with the cost of installing a basic broadband service using satellite or wireless technology. Uh, in recognising the importance of access to faster broadband, the Executive's Draft Programme for Government includes an indicator to improve internet connectivity. Mr. Boylan, first supplementary. Thank you, Margaret. Can call you and I appreciate the Minister's answer, but the Minister, Minister knows that uh, people are crying out for fixed line, and I'm just wondering, can you give us any more detail on how to address those areas, especially in rural Newry and Armagh? And also, does he not feel with the National Broadband Plan in, in the south, where business here will be under threat, and also customers, because if they, if they insta install that fixed line in the south, will it leave more customers going to the south? Gormil Margaret. Yeah. Um, the issues that I, I'm, I'm aware of, of investments in, in the Republic of Ireland, as, as the member mentions, you know, they, they have um, similar problems to the problems that we have in terms of rurality of, of many parts of Northern Ireland, except it's amplified in a much greater scale there, and they have a very challenging job um, in terms of getting uh, more fixed line and more fibre to, to, to premises. Now, I think we have, you know, as, I, as I was mentioning um, to the member in my initial response, a, a good track record of over £60 million worth of investment, which has been made over the last number of years, which has unlocked uh, similar figures of investment by the private sector. So there's been an excess of about £100 million invested. And that, that, that has produced improvements, including for people within his own constituency. Uh, it has 60, now 62 per cent super fast broadband availability. Now, obviously, not everybody has taken that that up. Average download speeds, as I mentioned, are 21 megabytes per second, which are well in excess of, um, certainly well in excess of what the, the uh, UK government wants to set as a universal service obligation of uh, 10 megabytes per second. Uh, there are still, and I accept and I acknowledge, and I won't, um, I won't deny that there are some who still do not have satisfactory speeds of broadband. In the members' constituency, I answered some questions last time about Fermanagh and South Tyrone, and the same is replicated in other constituencies in Northern Ireland. So there are about 12 per cent of people within Uri and Armagh who have speeds of less than two megabytes per second. I don't think that's acceptable. Um, I, I think that in this day and age, we want to aspire to have uh, fewer people in that position, and, and the member, I'm sure, will appreciate that there are always individual circumstances, which means that you can't get the, the very fast speeds to to absolutely everybody, um, but 28 per cent have more in his constituency, have more than 30 megabytes per second, so there are around a third of the constituency which has the, the fastest available speeds, and what we need to do is try to work on those others, that 12 per cent who have less than 2 megabytes per second, by whatever means, through super fast rollout, through the broadband improvement scheme, through alternative technologies, to make sure that they get a satisfactory broadband speed. I call Mr. Danny Kennedy. I'm grateful to the Minister for his uh, replies uh, thus far, uh, and he will know of my interest uh, in this particular issue. Is, is the Minister in a position uh, to state the level of commitment required to provide an adequate and effective system of broadband in Europe and Armagh, and can he indicate how much money has been earmarked uh, going into the immediate future? I don't, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I don't have a, a figure for the, the exact uh, investment that has gone in, but um, the I'm happy to provide that in, in, in more detail to the member. I have the headline and figures, which I'm going to repeat, which is the Northern Ireland Broadband Improvement Project has already improved broadband access for, for over 46,000 premises across the whole of Northern Ireland. When you break that down into constituency by constituency basis, for Newry and Armagh, which is the member's constituency, around 7,000 premises have seen improvements. Now, of those 7,000, 25 per cent of people have actually taken up the availability of those services. Uh, so there's a further 75 per cent who have been enabled to have super fast broadband, but haven't, haven't availed of that yet. Um, I, I accept, as I said in response to Mr. Boylan, that, um, that, that, is, that is not everybody. That's not, uh, that's not where we see this finishing or ending by any means uh, at all. We want to roll out better speeds and make more speeds available to um, people right across New and Armagh and the whole of Northern Ireland. Uh, and, there, and there are, as I've pointed out in this House uh, in, in times before, alternative technologies that are available. Uh, so people who struggle to to get fibre and, and will be some way down the line in terms of getting fibre coming to their premises can avail of, of what are rapidly improving technologies around wireless and, and satellite, um, which I would encourage the member in his constituency work to whenever 
people are asking about speeds to, to, to look at those, not just look at, at fiber, not look at, just look at fixed line, but also look at those alternative technologies that exist as well, which my department can assist uh, to fund uh, to ensure that everybody gets access to a reasonably affordable and satisfactory speed of broadband. Mr. William Irwin. Can I thank the Minister for his reply so, thus far? Uh, and given the, the, the issue uh, and the, uh, the problems with the speed of broadband in remote, remote rural areas, does the Minister have any plans to bid for more funding uh, to improve broadband in next year's budget? Mr. Speaker, it, it, it does all ultimately come down to, to money and the availability of resources. And I think the improvements that we have made, and I, I accept it, we still have some work to do. Um, uh, not all parts of Northern Ireland have benefited from, from the investments. Um, but that £60 million investment that we have made over the last number of years uh, has improved our speed and to the point where broadband speeds to the point where we are around uh, the UK average. I want to be better than the UK average. I want to be at the top. Um, I want Northern Ireland to have that competitive advantage that comes with having um, access to super fast broadband for, uh, for our businesses and for companies wherever they are located in, in Northern Ireland. But I very much welcome the, the, the Chancellor's pledge to uh, invest £1 billion pounds for better broadband within the UK, and we're obviously uh, looking at uh, the ramifications of that for, for Northern Ireland and how Northern Ireland might, might avail of that funding and how that is distributed. Um, but we have, in the meantime, been developing a, an ambitious plan uh, that would significantly improve speeds right across Northern Ireland, and particularly in, in rural areas. Now, that, that is something that will be costly uh, and will take some time to develop, but it is something that I want to discuss in more detail with the Finance Minister during budget discussions. And I think it is incredibly important that we all uh, support ambitious visionary plans to improve broadband, because as, as members from all constituencies have said to me over the course of the past six months in various question times, that this is seen as a critical area, uh, a critical issue uh, in all areas, and incredibly important for improving and enhancing the competitiveness of our economy. Call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, as you have said, um, there are a number of people across Northern Ireland who do not have access to fixed line broadband. There is an, off, an upcoming auction of Ofcom um, for mobile spectrum will be considered. Is there anything that he can do to ensure that there will be equitable distribution of spectrum to ensure that there will be genuine choice of provider for rural dwellers? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member, for, for a question. Yeah, look, I, th I, think, I, I think the Member's point is a, a, is a very good one uh, from a perspective of I think we are somewhat transfixed with getting fibre to premises. And, and, and that's absolutely, and I don't want to say that that's not what I want to do, Mr. Speaker. That's, that's certainly the ambition uh, that I have um, to get as many premises as we possibly can to get fibre and therefore to get the fastest speeds that are, are available. But there are alternative technologies which are available. I've mentioned wireless and, uh, and satellite, which um, maybe had a bad reputation before, but are, are fast improving. Uh, and, and the member makes a point in particular around, around 5G. Uh, and I think there is an opportunity with the eventual opening up of the 5G spectrum to have um, to use that as a, it won't be a direct alternative for fixed line fibre broadband, but it will be something that, particularly in remote rural areas, may provide the opportunity to have a decent speed of access to the internet for, for individuals and for businesses. So it's certainly something that I'm very mindful of. I've had uh, discussions with Ofcom about it and a range of different other issues, uh, and, and, and also discussions with some mobile providers. Uh, and I know that some of them are very, very keen to ensure that their, their footprint in Northern Ireland, their infrastructure in Northern Ireland is enhanced and improved. And that's certainly something that I'm keen to, acknowledging that it is a, a regulated industry, it is something I'm very, very keen to continue to monitor and work with uh, the various mobile operators to enhance not just 4G, but also to seize the opportunities that 5G will present. Call Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers to date. Can the Minister assure me that the future schemes will prioritise rural, community, rural border communities like Cullihanna, Cullaville, Otnamakan, Armagh Brig, Derry Noose, Madden, College Land, Blackwater Town? And will he give me an assurance that BT will be held to account for delivering fixed line broadband to a specific number of rural houses, homes, and businesses? Mr. Speaker, there's, yes, there's, there's, somebody pointed out, there's the uh, statement for the local press already written. Um, and look, uh, the, the investments that have been made have been because when, when, you look, when you look at the data, if you look at broadband availability for Belfast, for example, 100% uh, uh, of premises in Belfast have, are able to receive five, five megabytes or, or, or more. Uh, it's 97 in terms of 30 megabytes per second, so really, really fast speeds. So the issue isn't. 
Um, we have done well in investing in, in towns like Belfast, or cities like Belfast and other towns across Northern Ireland. The problem isn't really, and I'm not saying it isn't, there aren't pockets within towns uh, and cities. The problem is, is almost entirely a rural problem. That's where the, the investments have been made. Uh, that's where the Broadband Improvement Project has been investing most of, of its money into rural areas. Uh, and I would expect that any future scheme will do that because it, we, I, don't, I don't want to just, I'm not happy with just having very, very good figures, successful figures in, in Belfast or in Londonderry or in other urban areas. I want to see those same standard of figures spread right across Northern Ireland and everybody benefiting from um, having good internet access. Uh, that will help, as I say, uh, competitiveness in the economy. And as a member knows from his constituency, uh, there are a lot of good businesses in rural parts of Northern Ireland who need to have. It's an absolute essential requirement now that they have good internet access. Many don't have good enough access as it is. So I want to see us invest more, and I look forward to the members' support um, in the budget for um, more funding for broadband investment that will help people in his constituency and elsewhere. Well, Mr. Jerry Mullen. Mr. Speaker, as the member will be aware, shortly after taking up post, I commissioned an independent review into allegations of abuse within the Renewable Heat Incentive Scheme, which has identified cases of possible gaming and non compliance. I can confirm that work is ongoing to investigate the potential to take enforcement action where there is evidence that there has been non-compliance with the eligibility requirements. Mr. Speaker, advice is being sought from the Departmental Solicitor's Office and discussions are ongoing with Ofgem as scheme administrators. Mr. Mullen, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, does he have any sense of responsibility in trying to identify both those who have approved and those who have done uh, drawn down money in respect of the initiative? Yeah. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, as, as a member in the House of the War, this is an, an issue which is subject to a live PAC investigation. And I don't think that, and I'm sure that the member and, and other members wouldn't wish me or themselves to do anything which would uh, compromise a, a successful outcome to that investigation. And, and, and these, are, this is, these are serious, serious issues which I am um, very seized of the importance of and I'm dealing with um, um, on an ongoing basis to try to find a resolution to many of the issues that have flowed from um, the, the allegations and concerns that there have been with the Renewable Heat Incentive. So my department, Mr. Mr. Speaker, is currently developing a proposal for changes to the Renewable Heat Incentive, which, if accepted, would lead to a significant reduction in future costs to the Northern Ireland Executive. And this requires further detailed discussion, including legal advice and further engagement with the European Commission, given that the scheme received approval within the state aid regime. I plan to bring a proposal to the Assembly in due course and, and issue a consultation document as early as I can in the new year. Mr. Speaker, additionally, we are also pursuing stronger enforcement of the existing regulations through Ofgem uh, so that abuses of the scheme are addressed as effectively as possible and that any possible fraud cases are dealt with rigorously. Well, Mr. Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, will the investigation initiated by the Minister be able to distinguish between maladministration and illegitimate installations, in other words, fraud, uh, and are the police currently investigating? Mr. Speaker, as I, as I pointed out to, to the member um, in my answer to, to Mr. Mullen, these are, these are very, very serious allegations of fraud and abuse which were received, which uh, have been given the due seriousness that such allegations would require. And that's why we have con carried, begun, commenced, carried out the investigations that, that we have. And, and, and I am absolutely adamant that, that where there is proof and evidence, and I think that's the important bit of this, is it has to be proof and evidence of um, abuse of the scheme, that appropriate action, and all appropriate actions, including if required, criminal proceedings should be taken against anybody who has abused the scheme or, or, or defrauded, sought to defraud the scheme. Call Mr. Connor Murphy. The <coughs> Minister has quite rightly outlined that the PAC are doing a piece of work on this and in relation to financial accountability in relation to the scheme, and obviously their recommendations and report will come both to his department and to my own committee. Uh, and he, he has said in a previous response that he's bringing forward a new scheme, uh, and, and, and one which obviously will hopefully be more robust. But what, in terms of management of the scheme in his department, uh, what lessons have been learned there, and what new system will be put in place? Because this wasn't just simply about, uh, you know, a suspicion of fraud. This was about management of a scheme from within the old Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Yeah, look, I, I accept the, the points that the, the, the member has made, and, I, you know, I, and I'm sure that in his role as, as, as chair of the committee, he will ensure that you know, not only are we learning lessons, and that, and that is absolutely critically important, that's what 
uh, we have been doing through a range of different investigations, which the, the, the member and his committee are, are very familiar with. And we must learn from those lessons, and, and, and not just learn from them, but actually implement the recommendations, so that um, not just in terms of this scheme moving forward, and we do have to manage this scheme moving forward, uh, and, and new arrangements have been put in place, and a, and a specific team has been put in place to do that moving forward, to give it the due attention that it, that it deserves. But we also have got to learn those lessons from the RHI scheme and apply them to other projects, not just in, in my own department, but right across government, right across the whole executive. Call Mr. Gordon Lyons. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And it's very clear uh, that he understands the seriousness of um, the situation in regards to RHI. Can he update the House as to the actions that he has taken in regards to the accusations um, that the RHI was subject uh, to fraud and abuse? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for his question. And I do take this issue uh, extremely seriously. I think it would, all ministers take accusations of fraud and abuse exceptionally seriously. And that's why, back, I think it was in, in July, that shortly after taking up post, I, I commissioned an independent investigation into to those very uh, accusations. And that review has been examining a, a sizable number of instalments right across Northern Ireland and has identified some significant weaknesses in the scheme. Uh, and those, those findings, Mr. Speaker, will be used. Uh, to inform the next steps, and, and, and clearly we will include consideration of recovering payments from any participants found not to be complying with their obligations under the scheme. Well, Mr. Jim Mr. Speaker, uh, it might cost him his job, but would the minister agree that at least one of his predecessors, particularly Mrs. Foster, was asleep at the wheel? in terms of failing to exercise ministerial supervision and ensuring that there was adequate cost controls in place? And can he give us an update on how much this squander-made instalment is going to cost us into the future? Yeah. Uh, the, the minister or the member um, describes it as squander. I, I didn't see him referring to it as squander whenever he wrote to me a few weeks ago, pleading for a constituent of his to be included uh, in the scheme. Um, it seems it's, seems, yeah, it seems, seems it's, seems it's squander when it suits the, the member. Um, look, you know, I don't agree at all with the beginning of his uh, question, statement, or I was going to say rather than a question. Um, the, the evidence shows that, I mean, and the member will know, he's long enough in the tooth. I may even be departing this place very soon if uh, reports are right. Um, to know that policy, policy experts, so, so-called perhaps policy experts within the department devise policy. In this case, uh, independent consultants were employed, uh, consultants who have come before the PAC and said they got it wrong. Uh, the advice given to the minister at the time by those external consultants and the experts, policy experts within their department. Were wrong, uh, and Minister, there is, you know, it's very clear to me that Minister followed all advice given to them, um, and as a, because that advice was wrong, it was based on bad grounds. Um, the scheme was badly designed, and, and nobody has, at, at least of all me, has denied that this is shocking, that there are problems here, and that we need to deal with those problems. But my focus now, Mr. Speaker, is in tackling the serious allegations of fraud and developing a plan of action to deal with the financial implications of RHI and to, as soon as possible, uh, examine the ways in which we can mitigate and start to reduce the cost of the scheme. Before I call Mr Potsy McGloan, I advise him that he may not get a supplementary. Mr McGloan. Keshtever Kahar, question number four. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Executive has made and continues to make significant investment in Northern Ireland's infrastructure. As a member of the executive, I have regular and ongoing discussions with all my ministerial colleagues, including the Minister for Infrastructure. Between 2011 to 2016, there has been £354 million worth of investment by the former Departments of Enterprise, Trade and Investment and Employment and Learning in capital infrastructure projects. The Minister for Infrastructure and I both recognise the importance of targeted investment in our infrastructure as an enabler and driver of economic growth. Physical and digital connectivity are important in supporting our future economic competitiveness and social well-being. The Department for Infrastructure is engaged with my officials in the development of the draft economic strategy, which, together with the draft investment strategy for Northern Ireland, will set out in more detail the executive's priorities, priority areas for investment in the years ahead. Investment in our infrastructure it requires long-term planning and a sustained focus on delivery to meet the anticipated needs of today's as well as future generations. 
That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions, and I call Mrs. Jenny Palmer. Mrs. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister outline any discussions he has had with Tourism Ireland about investing support to Northern Ireland tourism? I am um, actually due to meet with the Chief Executive of Tourism. I have already had um, some discussions uh, with the Chief Executive of Tourism Ireland, as well as um, on a casual basis, but also more formally with the Chair of um, Tourism Ireland. Uh, and I am actually due to meet with the Chief Executive of, of Tourism Ireland in um, the next number of days, actually at the tail end of this week. And, and I look forward to a, a hopefully a positive discussion around what my priorities for tourism and the development of tourism in Northern Ireland are and uh, how we can align uh, the work of Tourism Ireland what, with what the sector here in Northern Ireland are doing and also what Tourism Ar Northern Ireland are doing to develop and improve our tourism product. Mrs Palmer for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister thus far. Can the Minister ask what support he can ask Tourism Ireland to support the, the problem of our own excellent airports and the promotion of our own excellent airports as, a, as opposed to just Dublin Airport? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I th thank the member for her question, and, and she will know that th this is an issue which I've been um, very interested in since, since taking up post for a whole, whole range of different reasons. Um, and, and, you know, and I know that um, uh, comments were made by I noticed comments by the uh, chief executive of the international airport recently, um, similar to what the member has, has just asked me about. Uh, and I have to say that, that I agree with those comments around the need for the better promotion of not just the International Airport, but also the City of, uh, city of Derry Airport and the Belfast City Airport too. Now, I, think, I think we all accept, including myself, that you know, Dublin is a very different place, much bigger, bigger economy than ours, bigger airport, better developed, uh, and it is one airport serving a, a city population of around one and a half million people. And as such, it will always have certain advantages over a region like ours and the scale that, that we have and the fact that we have three airports serving, serving a small region. But that doesn't take away from the point that, that I'm sure the member would, would echo that entry into Northern Ireland from other parts of the world is, is, is as easy and as simple as it is going into Dublin. Uh, and I think we want to work, and this is why I have um, said that I want to establish a, an air routes uh, task force to uh, examine ways in which, to, first of all, to identify key routes and also to then to develop policies and interventions, Mr. Speaker, that can attract airlines to those key routes uh, so that Northern Ireland is better served in terms of our connectivity. I welcome uh, the announcement last week uh, that Iceland Air are to fly into um, Belfast City Airport from next week. Uh, and while maybe people don't see Iceland as a, as, a, as a big marketplace or a big tourism, inward bound tourism destination, there, I think there's about 16 or 17 um, entry points into North America via uh, Reykjavik Airport, which is a, a bit of a hub airport. So I think it, it expands our wider reach too, and sometimes that's the way a, a, a region like ours will develop its air connectivity um, through those sorts of other hubs, and that's why I suspect that that's something that the recommendations of the task force will come forward with. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What discussions has the Minister had with NIE networks about the capacity of the grid to cope with approved and planned wind farms or single wind turbines? Mr. 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 Speaker, I have extensive uh, discussions with not just NIE networks but, but other key players within the, the energy sector regarding um, the grid infrastructure in Northern Ireland. And the, the member will, I'm sure, appreciate um, it's not, not always viewed like this by, by some, but our grid is a, a, pre, a scarce and precious resource. Uh, which needs to be handled carefully as such. Um, and, and we have, as a member will I'm sure be aware, uh, pressures on the grid and a need for further investment in the grid. Uh, that is an issue that is handled through um, the regulator and the um, NIE working together on their, their price determination. Um, um, and they're, I think they're in the process of doing it at this moment in time, and I look forward to the, a positive outcome to that. Because I do want to see investment in our grid. I want to see investment in our grid for a whole host of reasons. Um, particularly because, as I, as I travel around Northern Ireland, I see this on a regular basis, where many businesses want to expand their business, and they, and they have not only is there sometimes a, a cost in getting onto the grid, but it can take a long time to do so. Uh, so I want to, particularly for, and it's something that I've noticed in particular in my travels in the, the west of the province, and I want to make sure that um, getting a, a, a cost-efficient and time-efficient access to the grid isn't an inhibitor to the growth of companies uh, in Northern Ireland. Mr. Beggs, for a supplementary. Minister, from Assembly, answers to a question from my colleague Andy Allen uh, some 
2,423 planning applications for wind turbines and farms have been approved between May 2007 and March 2016. Can the Minister give me an assurance that those which have been built are all connected to the grid? I, would need, I wouldn't have that information. I would need to go and actually speak to, to NIE and to others to make sure that um, those that are built are all connected. You know, there'll be different. I mean, it was fact I was at a, at a, um, a business with um, Mr. William Irwin last week who had a turbine erected, but it wasn't yet connected. But that was all going through the, the process. So there, there is a process which obviously has to be dealt with in this. And, and I think we've got to be careful. In mind for the, there are a lot of there's a lot of demand on the grid, Mr. Speaker. But all of that demand. Um, it is difficult with the grid that we currently have to meet all of that demand, um, particularly with renewables, which the member raises. And I would point out, as I have to the House before, that at present around 900 megawatts worth of electricity is connected um, to the grid. There's about offers for approximately 700 more megawatts that are already out there, and there's another sort of 200 or so megawatts to be, to be offered. So that will get us to um, a position where, when all of those are, are onto the grid, um, they will be um, we will be able to meet our 40%. Uh, electricity consumption target by, by 2020. Um, and this is an issue which I'm very, very mindful of, very, very aware of, uh, and it's something that I expect to be raised uh, later this week when I'm with the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, giving evidence to them as part of their ongoing inquiry into the electricity supply in Northern Ireland. So it's an interest which has a far and wide, uh, it's an issue which has far and wide interest, not least in, in, on, in my office where you know, I want to make sure that energy is not an inhibiting factor in any way, shape, or form, for the future growth and competitiveness of our economy. Call Mrs. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the minister um, if you can update the house on how exports from Northern Ireland are performing? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we, we've we've actually just had um, the latest data in respect of uh, exports, as measured by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, um, released this morning, and these are these are figures for. Uh, the year ending quarter three of, of this year. Uh, and again, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's very, very good news for Northern Ireland business. Northern Ireland exports are up to £7.4 billion in the last year, uh, and that represents a 6% increase in exports. Uh, and the significance of the 6% increase is that that is the highest percentage increase in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, this, Mr. Speaker, is another really, really strong performance by Northern Ireland exporters, and I, and I pay tribute to, to all of the companies who have been working hard uh, over the last year to improve their sales outside of, of Northern Ireland, because as we all know, in a small region like ours, if we want to grow our com economy, um, we have to sell outside of our region, we have to sell more into the, uh, into the rest of the United Kingdom, but also to the rest of the world. Uh, again, I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, it's the manufacturing sector uh, and also the life sciences sector who have posted a 24 per cent increase in their sales over the last year. And I'm also pleased that, that, that markets outside of Europe um, are the ones that are driving this growth with a, a nearly 30 per cent increase in exports to the United States over the last year. Uh, so again, Mr. Speaker, the performance of Northern Ireland exporters has been excellent, uh, and I hope that that continues to be the case. Mrs. Cameron for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for that answer, and I very much welcome the continued success of Northern Ireland's um, exporters. Could the Minister tell us um, what steps he is taking to build on that success um, for Northern Ireland? Mr Speaker, I think it is important, um, as a member asked, that, that we don't just uh, rest on our laurels, sit back and pat ourselves on the back for a job well done. I think we have to build on the success uh, that we've experienced over this past year in terms of the last um, quarterly results show that we were the only uh, UK region to increase exports and this time it shows that we have the highest increase of any UK region. So that, that is a really successful performance for a small economy like Northern Ireland. Um, we must build on that uh, and that's why I have been bringing a particular focus to exports um, over the last few months. Um, the member will know that I've introduced a, a trade accelerator plan which is particularly focused on first-time exporters and encouraging them to look at markets outside of, of Northern Ireland. So we've introduced um, more a, a package of enhanced support uh, for accommodation and travel uh, to Great Britain and also f with uh, travel to the Republic of Ireland, various market introduction programmes and more uh, support, more um, in-market trade advisory support. I've also recently announced a new international trade plan, which will see the, the creation of a new trade advisory board. Uh, made up of many of Northern Ireland's best and most successful exporters to advise 
me and invest Northern Ireland in the policies that we should be developing to, to seize more trade opportunities. Uh, we will appoint uh, a series of Northern Ireland trade ambassadors with the aim of, of, of utilising the power and strength of our diaspora, which is spread right around the world. Um, we will also increase the Invest NI presence uh, with a particular focus and emphasis on trade uh, by up to, to 10 new destinations by, by the end of next year. And we are examining the potential of, of creating new trade, investment and innovation hubs in, in key markets. So that there has been and there will continue to be a, a relentless focus on trade and as, as, a, as a key driver Mr. Speaker, of growth in our economy. Well, Mr. Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the Minister uh, advise the House when he is going to uh, formally respond to the recommendations uh, made in the Energy and Manufacturing Advisory Group report? Yeah, the, um, the EMAG, as it was um, the acronym that was used for it, was, was uh, um, produced its recommendations earlier this year, uh, and I have been carefully considering those recommendations and I will use the, the recommendations, many good recommendations contained within the EMAG report um, to advise me and to help to shape uh, future energy policy in Northern Ireland. And I'm sure that the member will, will appreciate from his time already on the Economy Committee that um, the whole issue of energy is one that's very intricate, it's very interlinked and taking a decision in respect of one recommendation, for example, that the EMAG came forward with, will have consequences elsewhere in the energy system. So I'm, what I'm attempting to do, and what is a very complex uh, and often very technical area, is to try to take cognizance of all of the, the issues that are there, whether it's around renewables, whether it's around manufacturing and affordability, or whether it's around security of supply, and to come forward with a, a view on a comprehensive energy policy that will stand Northern Ireland in good stead, not just in the short term, but, but for many years to come. Mr. Chambers, first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. No. Speaker. Uh, I understand that the, the Minister uh, perhaps has uh, queried the figures quoted in the EMAC report, uh, which stated that large uh, energy users here face electricity prices almost 60 per cent higher than the EU 15 median. Does, that, does this mean that he is actually rejecting, at this point, recommendation two of the EMAC report? I, I think the, the point that I'm, I'm happy to go back and look at, at Hansard and what I said I think was in response to uh, a motion that came before this House a, a week or so ago in, in his and Mr Aiken's name, where when I think when you take it down to a per, uh, pence per kilowatt hour, the, the price differential, but while I accept there is a price differential, I'm not arguing that Northern Ireland, for the large and very large businesses, are paying more than the EU median, uh, but when you take it on a a uh, pence per kilowatt hour. I think the, the way that I had worked it out was it was about 30 per cent of a difference, which is still significant. I accept that. We're not disputing that there is a significant difference. Um, but it's a, it isn't an argument over substance. It's, a, well, it's not even an argument, I would say, Mr. Speaker. It's, a, you know, it, 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 it's a, an issue of um, the figure work rather than one of substance around the, the policy. And, and of course, I am, I'm, I'm committed to doing it. And the member will know and appreciate that um, the powers that I have as minister are fairly limited in terms of what we can do on our affordability, but, but be assured um, that I will do everything that I possibly can to, to keep the price of electricity for all consumers in Northern Ireland as low as I possibly can. Call Mr Paul Garvin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, could you maybe update the House in relation to what you plan to do about the apprenticeship levy? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I think I'm being on record of saying that um, I'm not a fan of, of the apprenticeship levy, which is, is a, um, a tax which is being introduced from next year on businesses right across the United Kingdom. Um, it will uh, see businesses with an annual uh, uh, salary bill of over three million pounds um, charge 0.5% of a tax on, on that, and, and this will help uh, hit uh, many businesses here in Northern Ireland and right across the UK. Um, so I'm not a fan of it. Uh, I think it is a very bad example of where the government are taxing on an issue where the policy responsibility resides with devolved administrations, including our own. And the Finance Minister and I are both on record in saying that this will be of no benefit in a monetary sense to, to Northern Ireland. Um, I recently launched a, a consultation, uh, which is a short, sharp, focused consultation uh, to take the, basically to take the temperature of the business community, and particularly, obviously, those businesses and sectors who are most affected by the introduction of the apprenticeship levy. 
And what I want to see coming from that consultation, Mr. Speaker, is firstly a better sense of the, the impact um, that the apprenticeship levy will have on businesses, and also to get some ideas coming forward from businesses though, as to what they would like to see us as a government do and as a provider of skills training for businesses to do in response to um, this tax on their businesses and also a tax on the public sector as well. Members, time is up.